Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your patience with our technology. Um, I'm Eileen Crosby. I'm the archivist at the Holyoke History Room. If you want to know more about the History Room, we have a brochure on the table. And it's here in the public library on the third floor. And I'm uh, well, happy to welcome you to our newly refurbished community room. And I want to especially thank Holyoke Media for being here as well to record this for people who can't be here, as Will said. This is Will Milton's <coughs> third history talk for the Holyoke Public Library. Uh, he retired in 2015 after four decades in uh, development for higher education and museums. He's also an author. He uh, co-authored his uh, father's memoir on his uh, father's time in the Merchant Marine and did a talk on here then. That book is still available at the library and through the press. Um, he belongs to a mandolin ensemble and of course has now become a local historian. Um, and in his spare time, he gardens. <laughs> so thank you so much, Bill. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to have friends here. Joe Blumenthal and I have played music together. He's the fellow who started Downtown Sounds in Northampton and did a lot for the music community here. We're here to tell a story about a pretty interesting building. Most of you probably have seen it. And uh, I, the first glimpse of it for you is right there. There's a little gable of the west side of the building. This is a wonderful walk along the canal that was done about uh, 10 years ago. And it's a wonderful addition to the green sprouts of Holyoke, which I very much support and which I'm sure all of you are hoping will continue. Now, let's see. We, this is 1907. The station, by that time, it had been taken over by the Boston and Maine Railroad. And it's sort of the version of that era's colorization system and Photoshop. Because if you notice, the train's coming in on the wooden boardwalk <laughs> instead of the rails. So it's kind of funky. But uh, I want you to notice this building here. That was not a Richardson building. It was added after he died, and it was probably the, the freight uh, uh, station for passengers. There's a freight uh, facility further down the line. We'll get a picture of that in a few minutes. So uh, this is the man, Henry Hobson Richardson. He was a large guy. He lived large. This picture was taken probably in the 1880s, early 1880s. And he was Amer the architect's architect. Only one for whom an architectural style was named, Richardsonian Romanesque. He was the first of what's called the Trinity of American architecture. Henry uh, Richardson died in 1886. He was the first. Louis Sullivan died in 1924. He was the father of the skyscraper. And the third is Frank Lloyd Wright, who invented the Prairie School. I want to paint a word picture for you tonight of thank you. a Sunday afternoon in April 1884, and a man who was there, an architect, wrote about the event. He said, ah, the best people in music. They were gathered here at Henry's studio and home. This was his first office in the building, and there he is, there's the man at his desk, and eventually he built to the back of it the studio for the company. So here's the event. Julia, his wife, and Henry, and a hundred of their clients, closest friends, Brookline neighbors, are in the garden and in the studios. There's a string quartet playing Haydn and Beethoven. And on easels in the studio are drawings of some of their latest projects. Albany Town Hall, Harvard's classroom building, Austin Hall, and a mansion for a very wealthy man, the Secretary of State, John Hay, 
and the Holyoke train station. Richardson's railroad stations were an innovation called the new architecture because they responded to the modern world. But this is the only station on the long line between New York and Montreal that he designed. It was one of the last designs that his health permitted him to, to visit and see completed in his lifetime. We don't know if he did, but he, he was well enough to do so. He was dead just two years after this building opened at age 47 from kidney disease. At that time, he weighed 375 pounds, so he lived large. My search in this story, there it is, right after it opened. My search in this story came up with two questions. How did a New Orleans lad with a stammer rise to such Olympian heights? And how did this jewel of Holyoke sink so low to become a canvas for graffiti? Its decline accelerated when passenger service to Holyoke was dropped in the early 1960s, and it became an automobile parts dealer and a machine shop. And this is what it looked like in 2019. You can see it was a mess. There it is from the south. And there's the platform by, this, by the train line. There were lots of ideas to how to bring it back. Many thought it was a goner, but there was an occasional lofty scheme like this landscape architecture master's thesis by Nancy Howard of, of Holyoke. But none, they all came to naught. Until the hero of our story, Dave White, who's with us tonight. I'm happy to say, and he can take some questions if you have any. And I asked him how he got into it. He said, I just got tired of hearing people say somebody should fix it before it falls down. And so he bought it. That was about four years ago. He's a businessman here in the town who stepped in to save the station, helping the revival of Holyoke. He did it without any government grants, no demanding investors and too little municipal backing, in my opinion. So here's a then and now series. There it was, 2019. That's what it looks like today. Here it is, and today. And there it is from the south end. And there's the platform. That's been repaired and restored. I agree. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Dave, would you just raise your hand so everybody will know where to find you? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, back to the architectural Mount Olympus. This is Henry Hobson Richardson about 1860, and, and this is not a rags to riches story. He was born on the Mississippi River in a sugar plantation that his grandfather owned here on the left. William Priestley was uh, from England and came to this country because his father was in trouble. His father was the most famous chemist of his age, Joseph Priestley. He discovered oxygen. He published 140 books. He invented the, er the pencil eraser that we all use. But he was nearly hanged by a mob that was shouting he was a religious heretic and a traitor for supporting the ideals of the French Revolution. Young Henry grew up the son of a New Orleans cotton merchant. His father's friend, the Senator Judah Benjamin, offered Henry an appointment to West Point, but he was rejected. One biography biographer of Henry claims it was due to his minor speech impediment and that Henry never really got over the insult and humiliation. So he settled for Harvard. <laughs> there he had in different grades. He was more of a party boy than a scholar. Slender and handsome. He was nicknamed nothing to wear because of his lavish wardrobe. But a hundred miles west of Cambridge, those years saw major changes out here. 
1857, Holyoke had begun to be transformed from a sleepy farmer's village into the largest planned industrial city of its time. The region's first railroad crossed from Chicopee to fuel the canal venture that was promised by a dam at Hadley Falls. This is the train line crossing from Chicopee and passing out on the west side of the river. Over here you see 1881 and it's, it's all happened. All of this has been built as a result of that dam and the, and the railroad coming through. But there were plenty of ambitious business ventures that failed getting to this point, many ending in financial collapse. And high-flying investment schemes were not the only collapse because Holyoke's giant water prize venture, water power venture, a log dam across the river, failed on the first day that it opened. Still, the hunger for water power was a very powerful magnet for business ventures and investors in New England's version of the Industrial Revolution. A second dam was promptly started and it proved it could hold back the mighty Connecticut River. Holyoke became a major manufacturing center for wire and textiles and paper, machinery, turbine, innovation, screws, and the wonder of its age really in western Massachusetts. Pulling many, many strings of this industrial drama was this man on the right, Chester Chapin. He's the guy who made the North-South Railroad happen in, along the valley. He's probably the most famous tycoon you've never heard of. After his father died, the boy had to find work and he learned to sell strong drink and cheap cigars at the South Hadley Holyoke Ferry. After losing interest in the life of the merchant, he became the da a dashing stagecoach driver that must have attracted the interest of his cousin, Dorcas Chapin. Now she was, lived with her family over a tavern in Chicopee, which her dad operated along with a profitable cattle business. Here's the tavern, and uh, here's his, the Springfield stage. Over there on the far wall, on the fall picture is the tavern sign, which still survives. An antique downer, dealer down in Connecticut still has it. He paid $100,000 for it. And so Ch Chester, he rode the wave of the revolution. After he married Dorcas, who grew up in this building, and with her family to lean on financially, his natural business sense began his rise to become the richest man in Springfield. Now there's, there's no picture of Dorcas. I've looked everywhere, and there are other important women in this story. But it's kind of a shame that so many unsung women uh, from those times are largely invisible to history. But Chester's forgotten too. Uh, and he's the guy who made Henry R Richardson a giant in architecture. As much as Henry became a giant, Chester was a giant in his own field and their lives intersected. He bought a share of the East-West stagecoach line first and then got the Springfield to Brattleboro mail contract then traded them all in on a steamboat, which you can see over here, that plied the, Miss the Connecticut River. It had the, the wheel in the rear because the passageway through the, the rocks was difficult at Enfield Falls. And he eventually cornered the market for the Hartford to Springfield steamboat trade. Like so many of Richardson's architectural treasures, this tavern is no more. It vanished in the 1920s, was torn down, 
and uh, it was a wonderful building. There's an old junky uh, radio station building in its place. It's on Chicopee Street, the oldest part of Chicopee near the river. And this was Chester's Line, the original business, major business, the Connecticut River Railroad. He combined different railroads and built uh, 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 the uh, Springfield Northampton part of the line and it became a big success. As his wealth grew, his fellow steamboat entrepreneur, Commodore Vanderbilt, Cornelius Vanderbilt, wanted uh, Chester as a partner and an investor in the mushrooming railroad industry and Chester was a natural and he would go on to make Springfield uh, a hub of railroad New England. And the finest historian of the early years of railroading, a man named Edward Kirkland, wrote about Chester. He, he said, he was one of the great railroad capitalists of New England, indeed of the nation. He became a large investor in the New York, New Haven, and Hartford, the Connecticut River Road, the Boston and Albany. As for Vanderbilt's New York Central Railroad, he owned 3,400 shares and a seat on the board. He was called by one of his associates, the hardest man I ever knew. The model of presidential management, which means dictatorship, he determined the composition of the board of directors, assembled it at his pleasure whenever anything happened, and secured the succession to the throne. Well, with the 1825 opening of the Erie Canal, Boston's commercial route west was blocked by the Berkshire Hills and all of that traffic began to flow up the Hudson onto the Erie Canal. But Chester bulled his way out of the problem. It took years, but he formed the longest railroad in the world at the time. This line, which stretched from Boston to Albany. Another line would eventually be built, and I'll show you that in a minute. So not only did he s assemble the first major north-south rail system along the Connecticut, he led and extended the, extending the original Boston and Worcester Railroad first to Springfield, and then in 1854 he gained control of the Western Railroad after it was completed from Albany to Springfield. He was a powerful man with a growing family, and he decided it was time to move to Springfield and he built this mansion there. No longer exists. And it was there that his daughter Anna was courted by a young Harvard lawyer, James Rumrill, who was the son of a fellow vestryman in Chester's Unitarian Church in Springfield, and that man was an influential Springfield manufacturer. James and Anna married, and they honeymooned in Europe for a year. <laughs> what times? One of Henry's biographers thinks that James was reunited during this time in Paris with his Harvard drinking buddy, nothing to wear, Henry nothing to wear Richardson. <coughs> Henry's mother had urged him to stay in Paris where he was studying at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. She did not want him to return to Confederate Louisiana, but the family funds dried up. So he was forced to work as an architectural draftsman to fund his studies at the school there. Their friendship, Richardson and Rumrill, which had started at Harvard in the Hasty Pudding Club, would go on to set the stage for the rest of Henry's life, and it appears that he would never again set foot in Louisiana. When the Civil War ended, Henry could return to America, but he really had nothing awaiting him but his sweetheart, Julia Hayden. Again, I can't find a picture of her either. But James Rumrill, he had plenty to return to. He was coming back to a law office job, and before long, he had joined Chester as attorney for Chester's newly acquired Western Railroad. Soon, James' father and Chester decided that their fellow Springfield Unitarians needed a new church. And young James was there to suggest, 
How about Henry? Give him a chance to compete for the commission. He'd never built a building. He'd never built a house. But the result was this stunning achievement, an amazing structure for a first time architect. It's monumental, inside and out. There's the inside of this church. Torn down in 1961 to build a parking lot. It was in pretty good shape, so it's a shame. Henry and Julia married, and with the help of her father, again the woman's invisible hand, he designed a house for them financed by her parents on Staten Island, and he commuted into a New York architecture firm that he started with a partner. And uh, it was there in Staten Island that he had a new neighbor, Frederick Law Olmsted. And that was the beginning of another beautiful friendship. So he hung out a shingle and by the following year had another Springfield Commission, this building, for the headquarters of Chester's newly formed Boston and Albany Railroad. Now, Springfield, lying at the midway point between Boston and Albany, put it in the catbird seat where the Connecticut Road crossed. And it eventually uh, became a major rail center and did so much to spark the prosperity of the Connecticut Valley for the next half century. Just to show you, here's two pictures of the same building. On the left, you can see there's a sign that's say, saying, uh, Look out for the engine while the bell rings. <laughs> there was a problem with Main Street in Springfield. And here's the, the train shed, the station at that time. This is the building, the headquarters for the newly renamed Boston and, and Albany Railroad. And uh, I can't honestly can't say how this commission happened. It's also in Springfield, and this is one of only two buildings in Springfield of his that survived. This is the North Congregational Church. It's now owned by a Hispanic congregation, but it stands near Museum Square in Springfield and, and is a beautiful building. The interior was painted white for some reason, but there's no question how this next building came to be. It's the Bank of Agawam in Springfield. It was owned by Chester Chapin. And then, two years later, this fantastic Gothic Romanesque cathedral to the law, the Hamden County Courthouse in Springfield, was to come Henry's way. Still an almost unknown American architect. I don't know much about this building's origins, but Chester was a powerful man in Springfield, and it's the only other building by Richardson that survives in the city. But by now, Henry was on his way, and probably without the help of either Chester or James, he got the commission for the most famous business building of his career, Trinity Church in Copley Square. To prepare for that project, it was time for him and Julia to move to Boston, and the ever socially conscious H.H. H. Richardson chose the suburb to live in, Brookline. And there he would be neighbors with some of these people, the art doyen, Isabella Stewart Gardner, whose great museum stands on the Fenway, and her husband Jack, this man Charles. Sprague Sargent, and I'll talk about him in a minute. And there he moved into a house that was owned by his Harvard classmate, Edward Hooper. And Hooper was very well connected. He was the brother-in-law of the great writer Henry Adams, and he was the son, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, he, was, he would go on to be treasurer for 20 years of Harvard College, so he was well connected. And it was there in that house, right there, that Henry and Julia would live for the rest of his life, building onto the rear of it uh, the rest of the eight, uh, uh, studios where he and his team built the rest of the 80 buildings. 
I should mention that uh, some years later, Olmsted moved here as well to be near his friend Richardson. And so it was a very heady uh, time and place. Here's the studio's design. The original house is down here. And he built, designed these studios that stretched out and back and here was his library and office. Originally, his office right, it was right here before the, the building was expanded. And here's his library and office after the changes were made. Richardson was a loyal colleague, and throughout his 20 active professional years, he relied on these two brothers from Worcester, James and Orlando Norcross, <coughs> to be his contractors almost exclusively. These two men also own quarries in East Longmeadow from which much of the brownstone and red sandstone that were the currency of the Richardsonian Romanesque style. And that stone is what makes Trinity Church so striking still 150 years later. This is a drawing from the master's hand of a parish house that was built about 10 years later for the uh, for Trinity. Here you see the studios with his team at work. By the way, when you see an asterisk next to the year a building was opened, there, that's the years are the, the year they were completed. And if there's an asterisk, it means the building's still standing. Here are his team. No women, of course. In those days, there were no women architects. But in those Brookline studios, many great careers were launched, including Stanford White, Charles Rutan, George Shepley, Charles Coolidge. And Richardson conducted them like a symphony orchestra. So I'm going to show you a few of my favorites among their products, and not just Trinity Church. This was a duplex for the Secretary of State, John Hay. He had been Abraham Lincoln's private secretary during the Civil War. And here's the back side building around the corner. This, this building here is where uh, Henry Adams and Clover Adams were to live. She, uh, they, they were close friends with the Adams and she killed herself before it opened. So he eventually moved on, Henry did. Never mentioned her in uh, his, his book about uh, uh, the life of Henry Adams. This is the Billings Library. Any UVM grads here? This is a wonderful library that he built. <coughs> Still standing, oops. These buildings both stand. This is the, on the left is Oaks Ames Memorial Hall in Northeastern Massachusetts. On the right is Oliver Ames Free Library. There were two brothers who made shovels in Northeastern Massachusetts, uh, which supplied the California 49ers for their gold digging, and they became immensely wealthy uh, from their shovels. And I added in here a picture of the two buildings to show how magnificently uh, they were sighted, and what a wonderful pair uh, they are. And Northeastern has another treasure that's a favorite of mine. This is the train station for the Old Colony Railroad. Uh, it's not a line that Chester controlled, but a, a station funded by the Ames family. And it has powerful hints of Japanese design that uh, inspired Frank Lloyd Wright. And I think it also inspired Dave White. Dave's grandparents retired to northeastern Massachusetts, so as a lad, he visited and must have been influenced by this architecture. And you can see down here, there are some other pictures through this, of floor plans done by the firm. Waiting room on either side, men's room, ladies' room, tickets booth in the lobby, and here's this carriageway. This is really actually the, the off side. The track was on the other side. 
Here's the triumvirate of what became known as the Railroad Beautiful Movement of the Boston and Albany Railroad. This came about in part because of enlightened Massachusetts corporate law. Surplus profits had to be plowed back into the business. Imagine that. So those tycoons that uh, would rather walk away with their stupendous profits uh, were forced to put it back into their companies. I'm sure they found lots of loopholes, but Chester Chapin at this point in his age may have been slowing down, but I just have a feeling he saw good business sense in making railroad stations beautiful, their grounds landscaped beautifully, and even the right-of-ways leading into the station were landscaped. And of course, the men who did this are here. It's James again, who was by this point uh, vice president of the Boston and Albany Railroad. Olmsted was hired to do the work with them. And Charles Sprague Sargent, here on the left, who came from great wealth. He was a director of the railroad, and these two men on the left were the construction committee who set this plan in motion. Now, Charles Sprague Sargent uh, was a cousin of John Singer Sargent, who many of you have heard of, a great American painter. But he was also, oops, he was also the son of a man named Ignatius Sargent who was an incredible businessman of the 19th century. And um, Sergeant Street is named for him. He was one of the original investors in the, in the development of the city of Holyoke. Charles, on the other hand, was not a businessman. He was a botanist, taught at Harvard. And he spent many trips out west looking for, for rare plants and trees. and. He was the founder and the first president, and in fact the president for decades, of Arnold Arboretum, Harvard's wonderful park. So this man was an unbelievable uh, force in American horticulture. I'm going to show you the, B the Boston and Albany stations. Uh, Richardson and his firm designed nine of them uh, in, in the time that remained in his life. And that, these are the stations that resulted from the collaboration of these three men. Uh, this is the first one built in Auburndale. And uh, it's many considered to be one of the best. I, I tried to put in interiors whenever I could find them. As you can see, and this, these, that picture was probably taken before it was demolished. Most of these have been demolished. Here's the, the floor plan. This is Chestnut Hill Station. But I, I, like, I like the covered part of the station here to protect the passengers. That was really an important innovation that came about thanks to Richardson's designs. It's a pretty interesting building, again, it's in Newton, no longer survives. This, this station does survive. I, I believe it's now a restaurant over in Palmer. And 1884, that's got a very interesting floor plan, as you can see, to make it fit onto the, the, the lot that they had there. And you can see the interior, and this is a, a real Richardsonian style train station. Here's South Framingham, another one that survives. This is a restaurant in that town. And I love the, the roof that you see here, these joists. It's a beautiful part of that, that structure. And this building's doing pretty well. These three stations were, uh, did not last, all, all in the Boston area, commuter stations. This is the more interesting one up here, Brighton Station. Uh, this is uh, Wobbin here and Elliot. This one still survives. It's storage for a golf course, Woodland Station in, in Newton. Wellesley Hills, 
another beauty, has some similar designs to the Holyoke Station. And the floor plan, again, is pretty simple. And then Richardson died. Uh, his partners offered to the family to carry on the work that he had begun. There were lots of commissions on their drawing tables. And they formed the firm Shepley, Rutan, Coolidge. The family agreed, and they continued to build stations for the Boston and Albany with James Rumrill as a major figure. And some 20 more were built. And you'll see them. There's one in Chatham, North New York, for example, others around New England. And they, they, many of them are in the, the style of, of Richardson. The one in Chatham, New York, in fact, is almost a copy of the Holyoke Station. He built two other, Richardson built two other train stations before his death. This one still stands in New London, Connecticut. It's an odd duck uh, with a beautiful interior. Uh, it has, it's made of brick and almost uh, was lost, but it's, it's not uh, quite so Richardsonian as the others. And it, um, it's kind of boxy, I think. Here's the other one that he built this was on the North, North Line, not the Boston and Albany. And this was built for Chester's first railroad, the Holyoke Station, the Connecticut River Railroad. It's really, it takes the Richardsonian model to its simple but elegant conclusion. Just a few sketches have been found. Uh, these are drawings of the gables and how they were gonna treat the windows. This one actually ended up being done. Uh, so did this one, I think. Uh, and as you can see, there's a tower. And this was, I think, Richardson's own drawing, the very beginning when he visited uh, the station. And that tower didn't survive cost cutting, but it did survive to the very last drawing before the decision. This is the presentation drawing, architects call it, when they come in to sell the client. And he made the sale, but it's, it's, it's really a pretty funny drawing. There's a kid with a, a hoop here, and ladies with big flowery hats and parasols and a, and a carriage over here. Uh, it's, it's a favorite of mine, I like it a lot. And here's the treasure. No pictures uh, exist I know of for the interior, but the, the plan of the floor does survive and it's a fascinating story in itself. Here you have the, the waiting room for everybody. The ladies room, men's toilet over here, the lobby you come in through here from Bower Street. But here's totally separate no door between the two is the immigrants room. Now, was this public health reasons? Was it bias against immigrants? Here's the baggage room. Again, no connection to the immigrants. They had their own toilets here. But one account said that the French Canadians would come down from Montreal and Quebec and they would camp in this room until they could find a tenement in Holyoke. That sounds like a, a reasonable story, but it does say a lot about Holyoke in those days. And the track side is back here. This is where the tracks run, and this ticket booth still, still exists. Now this is where the original train depot was in Holyoke. And we're looking east towards, towards the river, and this is about 1875. See these old, this, this Victorian house up on the ridge here? This is Depot Hill. A lot of it was cut away uh, by excavators. And you can see the wagons coming in. And here's that house at the top of the hill. And it was from the cupola of that house on Bower Street. This is about 1881. That this picture was taking, looking back to the city. And it's a wonderful photo that Eileen found for me. And uh, there's City Hall. Here's Main Street. Most of this does not exist here. This building has been, had its head cut off. There's still some of this building left. Here's the Perkins building, 
which was a hotel later. And then, but up here at the top of the hill shows you what Holyoke was really all about in those days. And here's a drawing of that building, not done by Richardson, but another uh, good architect. There were other architects at work in the city in those days. This was done by a man named Charles Sumner Luce. And uh, both these buildings are gone. This is the Opera House for Holyoke. This is, originally it was called the Whiting Building because he, he funded it, William Whiting. And uh, it was, became the um, Windsor Hotel. Both were lost. I believe that this one survived until 1967 though. And then a major fire created problems for it. But isn't it a pretty spectacular Victorian? The, the station is under construction. It's almost finished. The St. Jerome's Temperance Society gathers outside with their drum corps. Eileen found this picture. It's, it's, I don't know that it's ever been published because it's damaged. But it was taken by a man named Mylon Warner, who was an uh, area photographer here. And this library has 300 of his glass negatives. It's one of their great treasures. Many pictures of buildings in Holyoke. And this is the south end of the building that you see here. And you can see there's still men working on the roof. And then this is the finished product. 1885 it opened. Here it is today, the same building with the uh, improvements and men at work. This is the, the trust system in, in the station. It's a very interesting and beautiful part of the building. You loosen four bolts and you can tune the whole roof structure, plumb and level. However, it's blocked from view by a floor that was put in by the auto parts company, auto parts uh, shop, and they put in a little mezzanine floor, but Dave has been restoring it, and this is above what was the, the waiting room, this is what he has in mind. This is a, a rendering, and you'll see this, the trusses will still be up there. But the idea is to cut out the floor, build a balcony all the way around, and have this upper level as an art gallery, hanging walls, and the lower space would be available for whatever comes next. This is uh, uh, some of the renovations you can see that have been done. And this is the entrance through what was once a ladies room back to a reception area. Here's the reception area. And this is in the part of the building that was added on the south side by the auto parts dealer. Dave has put in skylights in there and he saved the original beams that supported the roof. Here you can see the exterior of the building on the south side. And now we're moving over to the little freight building. And Dave has been putting in uh, very sophisticated uh, safety and sanitation equipment. And this is what the building looked like about two months ago. It's advanced from this point. And this is going to be phase one. This is going to be a takeout operation uh, for, uh, for diners, as well as an ice cream stand. and. Uh, Dave's plans are to bury the utilities across the site, to pave the lot, uh, add signage, plus a manager. I keep telling Dave, get a manager. And uh, then he's going to need customers from all of you, of course. And this is the interior before and after of the, the cooking area. This will be the takeout operation and the ice cream servery. Here you see trackside with the train coming our way. Choo Choo's is the name of the ice cream business he's, he has in mind. And here's the ticket window. Another scene opening this spring. And there's the train. And that's my show. And uh, I'm glad you came here to enjoy it.
And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I'll refer any questions about the future in the station to my friend. Many, Steve. How many Richardson buildings still exist? I mean, about half, probably. He, 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 which is how many? 80. He built 80, so probably 40 of them survive. I know that, that the other architects that we looked at in that Trinity built quite a few more, you know, in the hundreds, but he only worked for 20 years. Yes. No other buildings, he built no other buildings in Holyoke. Someone said that the church across the street is one of his buildings, and we'll have to find out more about that. Uh, there were lots of copyists, people who took his style, and of course when he began his work, the Romanesque style, which was generated by old uh, buildings from the Romanesque period in southern France, he brought in elements of Japanese design as well. But we'll find out about, about that building's origins. Anything else? Other questions? Maybe someone here knows about the Presbyterian Church. Presbyterian Church in Holyoke? Yeah, the, church, the church across the street is the Presbyterian Church. Yeah, that's what, we were, that's what I was just mentioning. We'll, we'll look into it uh, to see if there's any uh, truth to that story. Did you have a question? Yeah. When train service to Holyoke was to be reestablished. Rather than using this station, they put $3 million, as I recall, into a platform. Well, it's not even. <laughs> it has an umbrella that is ineffective because it's so high above any, yep. any people and so forth. And I don't see anyone, frankly, using or leaving their car over there overnight. It seemed why put $3 million into that when this could have been. There were plenty of people who wanted that. Sure. There were plenty of people that wanted it, but it didn't happen. And uh, yes? They had a study, you know, which you can find online, about different sites in oil. For the station. For the Amtrak. And this was considered, but I think they were concerned about the cost, plus you had to deal with handicapped access, you know, Americans with disabilities. You have to have the high level platform because if you look at that program, for, for someone to get on there without having to use a, a stool requires a considerable height change. And you have to have parking. The first three things out of the box that yeah. any of the things yeah. had to do with. And, uh, I've read this study, you can download it online, um, but I think they felt like this was going to chew up a lot of money and, and to try and resolve not only the problems with the building, but with, the, with solving those three issues that have to be solved for every station. There was another issue, my husband really wanted this to happen. And he had to leave a few minutes ago, but I, you know, he would say that um, there was concern about the curve, having the okay. curve there, and he kept writing in this group saying, in <laughs> Europe, there are all kinds of train stations with <laughs> curves. That can't be the reason not to use the station. <laughs> but it turned out the real reason is the height of the trains, you would have had to take off that overhang. You know, there, there was a height issue that would mess with this, I mean, that's just another complexity and cost for this one. So hmm. we did realize that it had to be given up, but sadly. Did everyone hear the, the, the study is online somewhere. We'll have to find it and, and connect it to the library. Interestingly, there was a fight back in 1883 about the site of this station. There were a number of people, powerful people, who wanted it to be built where, the, where Depot Square was, the original station, and the owners, the Boston Albany, wanted it built here. They wanted to separate their freight operation down at Depot Square from their passenger operation. And so this little building here is not the freight, was not, never the freight station for Holyoke. It was a freight station for the passengers. Yeah, my guess is that's for Express. 
Railway Express. Right. Well, Railway Express was the was the final name, but um, uh, passenger trains in those days had carried milk. They carried Express. In fact, there would be whole train loads of Express because there was no UPS, no FedEx, and so forth. If you wanted to have um, fish or 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 seafood out here, it would come via the Boston Albany, and then be, be a car would be switched and end up going through here. That's how it got here. It didn't come by road because the roads were terrible. Yeah, and and also refrigeration. You got to think about how you're going to refrigerate. The original express cars had um, they they could use ice refrigeration because they're big if you go in a real car. It's a big structure. I told you we had some rail fans with us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Anything for Dave? Do you have a date yet, Dave? Well, the ice cream store should be open in April. And we're looking for, uh, we have somebody I think that will run the art gallery. And hmm. We're going to run the lounge, and we're looking for somebody to run the event space uh, or a restaurant uh, and lease the property out. But the, the entire property now is handicapped accessible, uh, and I heard all the discussion about why they didn't do that, but I think it was just somebody was more powerful than somebody else because all the thing about the curve. A real problem, and they could have had uh, an extended platform out there without a lot of problem and do that, but they just didn't want to do that. So, uh, we made the building, it's 100% uh, accessible, there's quite a bit of parking, so uh, we'll be repaving that as soon as we can get the underground utilities uh, in place. And right now, they're overhead. We don't want to see wires and things like that. And there's a question about gas availability for heating. And when we get those things down, everything underground, uh, we're going to be repaving the parking lot in the middle. And after it's repaved, then there'll be uh, gardens and things like that in place. So we're working on it. There's, there's no evidence that Frederick Law Olmsted had any, anything to do with this station. He did do some work here in, in Holyoke. Prospect Park, which is now called Pulaski Park, uh, was, was his firm's uh, product. And they did a number of studies, I've seen them, for Holyoke work that they did here that are quite strong. What's that? He did dozens of houses around here as well, Olmsted's. Landscaping. Design work. Yeah. And he also did the campus at Holyoke. That's correct. He did the, the master plan for Mount Holyoke College. Did he do Springdale Park as well? I'm not sure. There were several, I, several yes. parks that he did in Holyoke. Yes. And, and he can, his firm continued for another 40 years at least because his son and stepson, our nephew, took over the company and they did a lot of... 1980s. What's that? It actually continued until the 1980s. Yeah. Yeah, great, amazing. Well, you've been very attentive. Uh, I just want to say Dave's brother, Steve, came all the way up from the Cape to hear this talk. And the two of them have a sister and a brother who are great artists. So I know that there's some work already guaranteed for that gallery's opening. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. One, one last thing, uh, I, I'm giving this talk again at the South Hadley Public Library on April 16. If, there, if you have friends, train buffs that miss, couldn't come today, that event is April 16, Tuesday, April 16. It's an hour later. It starts at 6.30 at the South Hadley Public Library. Uh, and we'll hopefully have Holyoke Media to broadcast this event. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming, Holyoke Media. Thanks, Eileen. <laughs>